my name is Clancy's and welcome to the Iron Bars, my true crime YouTube channel. Thank you for joining me. So first things first, before we go any further, I want to wish you a happy 2022. So with that said, let's get into today's case and it is the case of Bongani Mvega, the Kranskop serial killer. So Kranskop is a district in KwaZulu Natal, also known as the Kingdom of the Zulus here in South Africa. So Kranskop is a tiny town in KwaZulu Natal that was founded in the 1890s. At first it was called Hope Town, up until it was discovered that there was another town in the Northern Cape which is another ninth province of South Africa that was also called Hope Town. As a result, the people that founded Kranskop realized that the locals were calling the town with its landmark, which was a cliff that looked like a head. So they called the town in Afrikaans Kranskop, meaning cliff head. So Bongani Samuel Mfeka was born in 1964. Unfortunately, I could not find his full birthday as well as his zodiac sign, which is very frustrating to me. So at the time of Bongani Mfeka's birth, apartheid was still thriving in South Africa. In today's case, Bongani Mfeka's mother felt that he was now old enough when he turned 15 to go to Johannesburg and find himself a job in the mines. So from what I could gather, Bongani Samuel Mfeka was the only child. He did have both his mom and father, however, his father, even though he was there physically, he was absent in his life. He seemed not to be interested at all in Bongani. Even though Bongani wanted a relationship with his father, but his father always seemed to resist him for reasons that he did not understand. He always wanted to hear the words, I'm proud of you, and he never heard any of those words, anything that has to do Anything that a son would like to hear from a father, he never heard it from his own father. As a result, he was very close with his mother. His relationship with his mother was quite strange, to say the least. I think it is safe to say that Bongani Mfeka was a mama's boy. To his mom, Bongani could do no wrong. Bongane told a psychologist that when he was younger, he knew that his relationship with his mother was of concerning to anybody that was looking from outside in. He recalled that when he started to get interested in girls, his mother noticed that and then she would bring him girls for him to have sex with in her house. And the concerning part for Bongane was the fact that once the girl was in the house, the mother would stand outside and put her ear against the window to listen what was going on inside. If they were having sex, she heard it all. If they were just talking, she heard it all. And Bongani felt that this was just uncomforting for him as a boy when his mother was doing things of this nature. He did not understand what was up with his mother. I kind of like no mothers like this if a boy kind of like finds a woman that he likes and then he introduces her to the mother in most cases that woman will never find peace will never know peace between her and the boy's mother because the mother either has a very close relationship with her son and therefore she knows the type of girl that her son is worthy of it becomes even worse if the son does marry the woman that the mother doesn't like. She never finds peace whatsoever. I'm just thinking what I would have done if my mother did something like that to me. I'd be mortified. I would be, I would run away from home, period. That's what I would do. Because no mother should be doing that for their sons. No. So it turned out that Bongani could not do anything, could not take any decisions without first consulting with his mother and get her approval. So Bongani Mfeka did go to school and he seemed to like school. He was very dedicated and very intelligent boy in school. However, when he turned 15, his mother told him to drop out of school and go look for work in Johannesburg in the mines. Bongani's mother felt that he was old enough to start working and bring in the money. Like the obedient or fearful son to his mother, he then dropped out of school and off he went to Johannesburg to find work in the mines. 
1980, Bongane was off to Johannesburg and it did not take him very long before he found a job in a mine in Randfontein. So Randfontein is one of the mining towns in Johannesburg. Like a typical Zulu man, Bongani had girlfriends absolutely everywhere, in Kranskop as well as in Johannesburg. By the way, these girls were the girls that he chose for himself, not by his mother. However, Bongani Semunfeka did have this one girl that he sort of loved or he was afraid that if he does not show her affection, his mother was going to have a problem with him because um, the relationship produced a baby together with this woman. So whenever he went down to KwaZulu-Natal to visit his mother, he was also visiting this girl that I think he loved or he feared if he did not love her, he would have a problem with his mother. So when Bongane went back to Johannesburg, he met a girl whom he seemed to have a steady relationship with. He lived with her for an entire year. He seemed to be caring for this woman, if not loved her. So in December of 1993, he decided to take his girlfriend that he's been living with for the past year to meet his family. Of course, the girl was very excited that she was going to meet Bongani's mother, her future mother-in-law. So they packed up all the things that they have bought for Bongani's mother as well as the baby and the girlfriend that he had back home and they filled up the car and off they drove to KwaZulu-Natal. However, as they were driving down to KwaZulu-Natal, and Bongani realizing that the high rises of Johannesburg are becoming distant, he then stopped the car and asked his girlfriend to also get off the car. When the girlfriend got off the car, that's when he started to attack her. He attacked her, strangled her with her own pieces of clothing, killing her for absolutely no reason. After he was done killing his girlfriend, he then went back into his car and drove off on his way to KwaZulu Natal to see his mother. Now, the question that I asked myself was, why did he do that? Is it possible that he killed this girl because he realized that if he got home, his mother was not going to be happy with him, that he is cheating on his girlfriend, the one that she chose for him and that he has a baby with, and now he is bringing her a girlfriend that she did not choose for him. So he felt maybe he felt something what, and then he decided that, you know what? It's already too late to tell this girl that I'm going to go home all by myself. So he disposed, he killed her and disposed of her along the side of the road and he drove off. Fortunately, his girlfriend's body was discovered by another traveler who had stopped for number one. He called the police immediately after discovering the body of this woman. The police collected the body of this unidentified woman and she was given a purpose burial. I know what you are asking, but Clantus, what was this girl's name? No one knows. Bongane never spoke of her using her name. And many of Bongane's victims will also be unidentified to date. So like the curious person that I am, to me, it does not make sense that you just simply strangle a person to death as if it is a normal thing to do and drive off. To me, it tells me that no, you must have committed some crimes before. You must have killed someone before. Or you must have at least thought about killing someone before. So what did I do? I went and looked deeper, and this is what I found out about Bongani Samuel Mfeka. As a matter of fact, Bongani Samuel Mfeka was a criminal, a known criminal by the police in Johannesburg. So by 1993, the police knew of Bongani Samuel Mfeka very well because this is what he was charged with by the Johannesburg police in the past. Number one, drug dealing, taxi violence, Often, taxi violence in South Africa involves killing. If you ever hear, or you can do your own research, research taxi, you know, taxi violence in South Africa, and you will see a lot of killing happens whenever there are taxi violence. So meaning that 
Bongani Mfeka, it's possible that he was hired as a hitman whenever there was taxi violence in Johannesburg. The other things that also that he was also charged with was assault, vehicle theft, as well as house breakings. So he was a seasoned criminal, even though he also worked as a minor. Now, as we get to know Bongani Mfeka, well, I do believe that he may have also committed rapes in the past. So as I kept reading about this case, I kept thinking, or I couldn't shake the feeling that the reason why he killed his girlfriend has something to do with his mother. That if he brought a new girl home, she would have a problem either with him or with the girl or both of them. So when Bongani got home in Kranskorp, his mother was elated to see her son back home. She unloaded the car of all the things that he had brought, including a suitcase of women's clothing. His deceased girlfriend's suitcase with her clothing would remain in his mother's house. So in 1994, when Bongani Samuel Mfeka was traveling back home to Kranskorp, he met a schoolgirl who was busy hitchhiking, also going home for the school holidays in December. So Bongani and the girl drove about 300 kilometers when Bongani suddenly stopped. The girl thought maybe he needed to stretch his legs when Bongani got out of the car and then he asked her to get out of the car also. So she did get out of the car and then, and then he walked with her into the bush where he raped her. After raping her, he strangled her to death with her own clothing. After raping and killing the schoolgirl, and then he dumped her body in the bushes at the side of the road and he went back into his car and drove to Grand Scorp. The girl's body was also discovered by a passerby who called the police immediately. When the police got there, they did not link both the body of his girlfriend as well as the schoolgirl to Bongani Mfeka. She too was nameless. So when I read this, I was thinking, okay, wait a minute, what goes in his head every time he travels back home? Why is he killing women whenever he goes home? But during the course of the year, we don't hear anything about him killing anybody. I wonder what is it that triggers him to kill women? Please comment down below and let me know what your thoughts so in 1995, Bongani Mfega decides to quit his job for an entire year. While he is staying at home in Grand Scorp, bodies started to pile up. At this point, Bongani Mfega has been a minor for the past 15 years, and he has no any other skills that he could fall on. And at this point, the previous year, apartheid had fallen democracy was now reigning in South Africa. And unfortunately, Bongani was not coping with the changes that were happening in South Africa at the time. Apparently, serial killers are not good with changes, hence they become serial killers. They seem not to be able to catch up with the changes that are happening at the time. So at this time in South Africa, everybody could move freely anywhere they wanted to. They could work in any place they wanted to. They could buy a house in the suburb near a white person or a house near a mixed person. Segregation was deemed unconstitutional and therefore abolished by the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa in 1994. And interestingly, during this time, there were also other serial killers that were busy on a rampage terrorizing communities all across the country, particularly in Johannesburg. So in 1995, Mongani Mfega devised a plan on how he was going to lure women to trust him before he murders them. So his modus operandi was to lure women at a taxi rank, build some sort of a relationship with them, and then out of the blue, he would then attack and murder them. Now, Bongani was good looking, he also spoke very well, and he was intelligent, and he spoke two languages, which was English, Afrikaans, as well as Isizulu. Being a Zulu man, he would also speak Isizulu. The best place that he could meet these women was at the Kranskorp taxi rank. Now, some of these women would travel some parts of KZN or KwaZulu-Natal in search for work. 
and often when they come to these places they don't know anybody they don't know where to go they have no idea where to start except to ask for help from locals and Bongani knew that and took advantage of the fact that they were new and they knew nobody in the area and Bongani also knew that if he used work as a tool to lure these women to their death it would work again I feel like I need to explain this back in the day pre-1994 if you were black and you spoke English you were considered intelligent or coming from a well-off family and so if you spoke English people trusted you quicker so if you spoke English you gained respect almost immediately from people so Bongani knew that very well not only he spoke English very well but he was also quite intelligent some of his victims were impressed by how well he spoke English cementing their trust as a salesman when he offered them a job in sales so on the 5th of june 1995 bongani mfeka meets a woman by the name of babsi lem Shongo, who had traveled from stanger in search of work in kranskop bongani mfeka met her at a taxi rank while she was busy looking about looking lost and then he promised her a job in sales he first told her that i am going to have to groom you to prepare you for the job bob Sile had absolutely no problem with that she was elated that she was so lucky that the moment she landed in grand Scorp, she already found somebody with a potential job for her so she allowed bongani to train her in preparing her for the job so they built a mentor-mentee relationship for a couple of weeks. Bongani even invited Babsile to his home. So while Bongani was busy grooming Babsile for the sales job, he turned around and said, actually the job that I have for you now is no longer in sales because that vacancy has been filled in. Now there is a vacant that is opened in a farm called Yamasdale. Babsila once again because she is in search of a job she did not care what sort of a job she got as long as she got a job and able to take care of her family back in Stanger she's all right when Bongani felt that Babsila trusted him enough he told her that she was now ready to go start working at Yamansday farm in Kranskop Babsila was so excited to hear that and that is when they decided the following day to take a trip through a field that is going towards Yamansdale farm when Bongani out of the blue began to attack Babsile. So he forced Babsile to kneel down before him as though to worship him. He wrapped a string around her neck and began to squeeze strangling her to death. After Babsile had died he robbed her of 200 rand that she had in her purse. He dumped her body there. He went back to the Kranskorp taxi rank looking for his next victim. By the time Babsila's body was found, it was difficult for the police to determine whether she was raped before she was killed. Babsila Mshlongo would be Bongani's first murder victim in Kranskorp. On the 21st of October 1995, Bongani Mfeka notices a woman by the name of Pilile Masuku, who was coming from Ganja in search of work in Kranskop. A handsome, intelligent, and charming looking man approaches Pilile and asks her if she needed assistance in finding a job. That was Bongani Mfeka. Pilile wasted no time and said, Oh my goodness, yes, I am looking for work. I just came from Ganja in search for work in Kranskop. And then Bongani was like, you are in the right place and you just met the right guy. It's your lucky day today. You have just found yourself a job. Pilile moved in with Bongani at his home and she stayed there for two days with him. Now, the part where I could not get was, was he still living at home with his mother or he found his own place in Kranskop? There's nothing said about his independence in Kranskop. All I know that... All I know is that he quit his job as a miner in Johannesburg, then moved back home. But now, when he did move back home, did he also find his own place? 
or he still lived in his mother's house because I'm a little bit confused how Pilile would live with Bongani for two days under his mother's roof and she would not have anything to say about that considering the fact that he also has a girlfriend whom he has a child with how would she feel when she sees another woman bring brought into the house to stay with them for two days so I'm not sure there uh, I tried to dig a little bit deeper but there was no information about whether he had his own apartment or his own house or his own back room or whatever the case was I could not find absolutely anything on that one on the 23rd of October 1995 Bongani Mfeka then took Pilile on an outing to a nearby river called Kumbu River at the river Bongani wasted no time he attacked Pilile strangling her to death when Pilile's body was discovered on the 3rd of November 1995 the police were also unsure if she was also raped before she was murdered while Pilile was lying dead at the Kumbu River, Bongani was on the hunt for his next victim at the Kranskop taxi rank. On the 31st of October 1995, Bongani meets a woman by the name of Tolagele Kanyile. She too had just arrived in Kranskop in search for work. So by now we all know that this is Bongani's MO. First, he meets a victim at the Grand Scope taxi rank, he promises them a job, he then builds a relationship in order for them to trust them enough before he strikes. Bongani also promised Tolagele a job. However, with Tolagele, Bongani did not build any sort of a relationship with her. He immediately took her to Yamansdale Farm. While they were walking to Yamansdale Farm, when they got almost close to Yamansdale Farm, that is when he struck. He struck Tolagele with a rock from the back of her head. She fell down, but she managed to but she managed to struggle and fight him off her. Unfortunately, Tolagele, she lost some consciousness. That is when Bongani began to rape her. However, when Tolagele came to, she decided that she was going to grab one of his hands and he would bite off a chunk of his flesh off. While Bongani was trying to strangle her, she managed to bite Bongani's hand and took off a chunk of his flesh making Bongani scream out of his mind in pain, leaving Tolagele to run and escape with her life. Tolagele ran straight to the Grand Scott police station where she reported her ordeal. Despite his injuries, Bongani did not stop his reign of terror in the community. He managed to rape and kill two more women who remain nameless to this day. On the 2nd of November 1995, Bongani meets a woman by the name of Nonoshezi at the Kranskop taxi rank. Well, you already know what he told her, right? Bongani Mfeka did exactly the same thing that he did with Tolagele. He did not establish any trust relationship with her. He then took her straight to Yamansdale farm and when he got to the same spot where he had attacked Tolagele, that is when he struck Nono who collapsed to the ground and when she fell to the ground, he began to strangle her to death. He strangled her using his belt. It's highly likely that he raped her before killing her. On the 6th of November 1995, he meets another woman by the name of Pumzile Pungula at the Grand Scorp taxi rank. She too was in search of work. He repeated his MO and strangled Pumzile Pungula to death at the Yamansdale farm. So Tolagela, when she went to the police station to report her ordeal, she told the police that she managed to bite a chunk of flesh from one of his hands. So when the police heard this, they wasted no time and called all local clinics and hospitals for a man that will walk in with an injury of a chunk of flesh bitten off his hand. So all the clinics and the hospitals were then alerted and they were on standby in waiting and waited for such a patient to walk in. The police further told the clinics and the hospitals around Kranskop that they should treat him, but they must make sure that they do not show him that they know that the police are looking for him. So on the 6th of November 1995, a nurse calls the police and lets them know that there is a man for treatment with a chunk of flesh beaten off his hand. 
Within minutes, the police sped off to the clinic and found the man still waiting at the clinic's waiting room, and they placed him under arrest. His name was Bongani Samuel Mfega. It turns out that when the bodies started piling up in Kranskop, the police had been investigating and trying to find the perpetrator. But it always seemed that the perpetrator was steps ahead of the police. Now, let's give it to Bongani. He's quite intelligent and he knew how to evade the law. He knew how not to leave any sort of evidence on the victims that he had murdered. So it made it difficult for the police in Kranskop to find exactly who the perpetrator was and place him under arrest and stop the killings. So when Bongani was taken to the police station for questioning, he refused to talk. Like, refused. It was, it was as if he was deaf and dumb. Like, mute. He would not say a word. He would not mention his name. The police were confused like, um, is he normal? Is he okay? So the police then contacted Bongani's mother to find out if he had any speaking disability. He, his mother said, no, he does not have. Then they spoke to Tolagelo who said, uh-uh, the man can speak perfectly. He used that mouth of his to lure her almost to her early grave. After the police had learned that Bongani could talk, that is when they started thinking that, wait a minute, this guy is hiding more than what he is arrested for, which was Tolagele's attack and almost killing her. Now, remember, the police at this stage, they do not know that they are holding the Transcorp serial killer in their custody. So while the police were busy suspecting that this guy is hiding something, they remember that by the way, one of the bodies that they had picked up was found at the same place where Tolagele was attacked. So they started thinking, is it possible that he might be the same guy who had killed that woman or all the other women? So they were quite frustrated by his silence because they wanted to get to the bottom of everything and also make sense of the serial killings that had been taking place in Kranskorp. So that's when the Kranzkop police decided, you know what, we need to get an expert in this case because clearly they are not going to win anything by keeping this guy longer in the holding cell. Now remember in South Africa, in order for you to stay longer in a waiting cell, you need to be charged within 48 hours of what you are arrested for otherwise your incarceration will be deemed unconstitutional and as a result you'll be set free and once you are set free they, it will be very difficult for the state to secure a conviction if any mistakes had to take place by the police so as a result the Kranzko police squad then called South Africa's top cop Pete Belfeld remember Pete Belfeld I think I've mentioned Pete Belfeld twice now in my channel. Now, Pete Belfeld has a 99% solved rate. So he was called in and he was handed over this case. However, Pete Belfeld did not work alone. He worked with South Africa's top profiler by the name of Mickey Pistorius. The reason why Pete Bellafelt was called as well to come and deal with this matter was because he had a mad interviewing skills, especially with difficult suspects. In 1996, Pete Bellafelt also had other serial killers in his hand. Some of these serial killers I have covered in this channel. So the South African Police Service KwaZulu Natal has sent Bongani Mfeka's docket to Pete Bellafeld as well as Mickey Pistorius to find out exactly if this guy they are holding in the cells is the same guy that may be a serial killer in Johannesburg and other parts of South Africa. So while his docket was sent to Mickey Pistorius as well as Pete Bellafeld, the Kranzkorp Police Station then charged Bongani with the rape as well as attempted murder of Tolagele Kanyile. So when Pete Bellafeld took Bongani's docket, that is when he realized that it is highly possible that Bongani Mfeka is the same guy that is involved with all the rapes and killing of unsolved cases that Kranzkorp has in his possession. 
So after Beat has established that, that is when he decided to travel down to KwaZulu Natal, Kranskop to be particular, to meet with Bongani Mfeka, who was refusing to speak to the Kranskop police. However, the Kranskop police believed with all of their hearts that they are holding the Kranskop serial killer in their cells. And as a result, they started collecting DNA samples from Bongani to ensure that these DNA samples are matched with those that they have found in the bodies of women that they had collected in the Yamansdale farm as well as Kunu River. As well as on Tolagele Kanyile. Remember, Tolagele had bit off a chunk of his hand and so she had his blood all over her mouth. So the police had collected that DNA too. So when Pete Bellafeld arrived in Granskop, he asked to speak to Bongani. When Pete Belfeld met with Bongani, he said that he met a man that was clean cut and polite. Now, Pete and another police officer hopped on the car with Bongani and took a trip to Johannesburg, where Pete was going to interview him. On the way, while they were driving to Johannesburg, Pete offered Bongani something to eat. Though Pete had a rule that no eating in the car that he is driving, so he made an exception with Bongani. So Pete bought Bongani a half a loaf of brown bread as well as a can of Coca-Cola. Pete watched Bongani as he ate. Every crumb or every drop of crumb that fell on him, Bongani would pick it and then he would put it back in the plastic to make sure that the car is kept clean. Even though he didn't know that Pete doesn't like people eating in his car, but because Bongani was a clean guy, he did not also like messy things. So whatever crumbs that fell on him, he would pick them and then he would put them aside on, aside in the plastic. So near Van Renan's Pass, Pete Bellafeld pulled over. Now in South Africa, we have like stops along the freeway, especially if you are going to travel long distance, where you can stop and go do your number one or your number two in the felt. And it is also a place where you can braai. Now a braai in South Africa, now a barbecue in South Africa, we call it a braai. So in those, so in those stop places, make you can actually, you can actually whip out your meat and start barbecuing. Here we call it brine, and you can start brine. So that is what Pete Bellafeld and the other officer as well as Bongani did. They stopped and then they whipped out some meat and started brying. So now KZN and Johannesburg are six and a half hours apart. So it is advisable here in South Africa that if you are going to travel long distance, you must travel at least a hundred kilometers then stop refreshing up and then drive again so a lot of like these like ultra garages as well as these uh designated areas where you can stop and and, and refresh in that are designed for long distance travelers so that they do not become fatigued along the way and cause unnecessary accidents so now Belfield used this technique to stop on the side of the road and start brying in order to gain some trust with the suspect. So once Belfield feels that he has earned the trust of the suspect, he then waits for a signal from the suspect. That is when he knows that he can get into the suspect's mind and begin to uh, build further trust with the suspect. Now, this signal often comes as a form of a request from the suspect. And indeed, Bongane requested for something. He asked for a glass of water. Usually, the signal would be either is a request of a cigarette, a blanket, something to eat, or a phone call. In Bongani's case, it was a glass of water. After drinking his glass of water, Bongani then said to Pete and his partner, Vellum Stain, that they knew him better in the few hours that they have been with him versus the police that have been holding him in the cell for so many days. Slowly, as he sat with Bellafeld and Stain, Bongani started to talk. The first thing that he told Pete Belfeld and Vellum Stain was about the murders that he had committed in Johannesburg. Bongani admitted to two murders, that of his unnamed girlfriend and a young schoolgirl that he had murdered along the freeway to his home in Granskop. 
So after Bongano was done telling Belfeld and Stein about the murders that he had committed in Johannesburg, that is when he started telling them about the murders that he had committed in Kranskop. He admitted that he intended on raping and killing Tolagele Kanyile. He then told them about two other women that he had lured, raped, but he let them go. Unfortunately, the two women never reported the incident to the police. My guess was after the ordeal, they decided, you know what, Grandscorp is not for me. They hopped back on the taxi and went back home or they went elsewhere in South Africa in search of work. I suspect maybe Johannesburg because many people will leave their homesteads and come to Johannesburg in search for greener pastures. Big Bella felt it, then asked Bongani why then he had killed all those women. He said that that's because they could not identify him after he had killed them. Basically, he got rid of witnesses. But he further told Pete and his partner that there was something about these women that attracted him. He said that they were slender and they wore dresses. He further said that the dresses were not sexually arousing him though. He said that whenever he saw a woman wearing a dress, he wanted to dominate her strongly and completely. He further said there is no domination that is stronger than taking someone's life. After Bongane was done with his confession, that is when he turned to Pete and his partner and begged them this, and I quote, Please lock me away and throw away the keys because if I am let out, I will kill again. To Pete Bellafelt, this is the first time that any suspect had ever requested of him such a thing. So after the bride, the three men hopped back on the car and drove to Johannesburg. As they were driving to Johannesburg, Pete Bellafelt then asked Bongane if he could take them to the spot where he had murdered the two women. Bongane in fact I had no problem with that, he did exactly that. After Bongane was done pointing the two places where he had murdered the two women, that is when Pete Bellafelt decided let's go back to KZN and return Bongane to Kranzkop. If you haven't noticed, that was Pete Bellafelt's interview skills on Bongani Mfeka, where he managed to abstract as much information from him about his first murders before he can take them before taking him back to Kranskop where he is going to confess the rest of the murders that he had committed in Kranskop, which by the way he already told Pete Bellafelt and Willemstein about. So when they got to Kranskop, Pete Bellafelt and Stain then decided to take Bongane to his mother's house. The reason why Pete Bellafelt takes the suspects to his home is because he wants to get a clearer picture about his background and his upbringing and the type of people that have brought him up in order for him to understand the perpetrator as well as gain more trust between him and the perpetrator. So when they got to Bongane and Feka's home, Pete Bellafelt focuses his attention on Bongane's mother. As she came out to greet him, she threw her arms around Bongane and held him real tight. She did not let go. Pete Bellafelt noticed was that his mother was slender and she was wearing a dress. You know, I've heard of men who have fallen in love with their mothers. I I'm not sure what that is called. I think it's called something like, um, I think it's called Oedipus Complex. I know I butchered the name, but it's called Oedipus or Oedipus, whatever it's called, uh, Complex. That's when a son falls in love with their mother and some sons, whenever they find a woman, she needs to resemble his, he needs to resemble his mother's mannerism, the way she speaks, walk, talks and all that sort of stuff which is kind of like disturbing to say the least, but I don't think in this case, it is a case of Oedipus complex with Bongani. I think he despises his mother. I think, I don't know, because if I believe that if he had Oedipus complex, he would be, he would be sleeping with women that reminds him of his mother. That's what I think. But here, uh, something ain't right. 
So Bongani and his mother chatted for about an hour and his father was in the house. He didn't even bother coming out to find out, hey son, why did you do what you did? Why did you embarrass my name? Why did you embarrass this family? Oh, do something, say something. But no, he decided to stay outside and stay out of the entire ordeal that was happening outside. I don't understand him though. I really don't. I know that in the 80s, 60s and 70s, when a black man found out that a girl has fallen pregnant or his girlfriend, he basically ran away. I don't know, maybe he got stuck with these two. I don't know. Something ain't right about this guy. So after Bongane had met his mother, that's when Pete Bellafelt and Novellum Stain took Bongane back to the Kranzkop police station where he was charged with eight counts of murder. One count of rape and one count of attempted murder of Tolagele Kanyele. So after Bellafelt has handed Bongane over to the Kranzkop police, that's when he decided to leave. As he was leaving, Pete Bellafelt then got a call asking him to return because Bongane wants to speak to him. And he wanted to speak to Bellafelt alone. So when Bongane and Pete Bellafelt sat down, that is when Bongane asked Pete if he could please testify for him. So Pete Bellafelt was taken aback and that is when he corrected him and said, no, I do not testify for the suspect. I testify for the state in order to find you guilty and convict you and sentence to an appropriate sentence. Bongani did not argue with that. He nodded his head and said, I understand. Just before Pete Belfort left, that is when Bongani reminded him of what he told him. He said, tell them what I told you. Tell them to never let me go because if they did, I will kill again. Bongani said to Pete, if you did that, then you have testified for me. Understand during aggravation of sentence, that is when Pete Bellafelt told the court exactly what Bongani had asked him to do. In court, Bongani pleaded guilty to the eight counts of murder, one rape and one attempted murder of Cholagele Kanyile. Therefore, meaning when a suspect confessed to the charges that are brought before him, there is no trial. So in court, while Pete was testifying for the state, Bongane seemed to have developed some sense of affection towards Pete Belfeld. He likely saw Pete Belfeld as a father figure, the father he never had. Bongani even asked Pete Bellafelt that when he's sentenced, he would like to come and clean his office now and again. Pete Bellafelt also took a liking to Bongani Mfeka. That every second week, Pete Bellafelt will go and collect Bongani from his cell to come and clean his office as Bongani had requested him. So it turns out that one day there was a riot in the prison where Bongani Mfeka was held. And instead of him joining the riot and seeing an, an opportunity to escape, instead Bongane worked with the wardens as well as, a, as, well as the police to, to block the prisoners from escaping because he knew if the prisoners escaped, they were going to go straight to Pete Bellafield's office and cause some sort of harm to him. And Bongane was not having it. He wanted to protect Pete Bellafield at all costs. When he was asked, why did you not riot? Why did you block the prisoners from escaping? He said, I do not want them to break and go to Pete Belfield's office. I don't want any harm to happen to Pete. At sentencing, the judge took Bongani's request to account and then sentenced him to eight life terms in prison. So just before Bongani was whisked away to start serving his sentence, he asked the judge for two things. The first request was if he could be remanded in a correctional facility that was near Pete Belfeld. And his second request was to be given the opportunity to say goodbye to Pete Belfeld. The court did not grant him his first request, but the second request he was granted. Instead, Bonganim Fega was sent to start serving his eight life term sentence at a KwaZulu Natal prison where he will be closer to his family. Now, psychologists and psychiatrists, as well as criminologists, all determined that Bongani Samuel Mfeka was not a psychopath. 
and that he showed genuine remorse for all the crimes that he had committed against those women. And the fact that he wished to be locked away and the keys thrown away is another factor that shows that he's not a psychopath. He knew that he was danger to society and therefore he needed to be caged for life. Bongani in prison, he did speak to a psychologist where he said to the psychologist that the killings seem to be a dream to him. He says that he does not remember some of the killings at all. He further described his weird and abnormal relationship with his mother. South Africa's top profiler, Miki Pistorius, this is what she said about Bongani Mfeka, and I quote, I believe that each time he killed a woman that physically resembled his mother, he was symbolically escaping from her clutches. As for his bond with Bellafeld, I believe that it was the poor attachment to his father. The twist in this story is the empathy and sympathy that Bongani Mfeka felt for his victims. I'm like, then why kill? Why kill? Clearly you have a conscience. Clearly you know murdering is wrong. Raping is wrong. Why do it? Why don't you control yourself? Isn't that what being a man is all about? Self-control? Well, at the end of the day, this man has committed heinous crimes. He raped and murdered innocent women and uh, all because of what? Because he wanted some sort of balance. That is not balance. That is wrong what you did, man. Wrong. And I agree. You should be locked away for life. You need to die. You need to rot and die in prison. Period. The saddest part for me about this story is the unidentified women, nameless victims that Bongani had murdered. To this day, their families don't even know what happened to their loved ones. Like, they don't know. That breaks my heart. It really does. Anyways, that is it, guys, about the Kranskop serial killer, Bongani Mfeka. So before I ask you to subscribe, I would like you to do this one important matrix. Like this video because liking a video, it does get my video to be seen by more people and therefore people subscribe to my channel. So if you have not subscribed to my channel, please consider subscribing. Also, do not forget to click the bell notification so you do not miss out on any of my new true crime uploads. And please do leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think of this case. And I will highly appreciate it if you share this video far and wide. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time with a new true crime video. Goodbye.